Hi everyone, it's Becky here. Welcome to another new video on my YouTube channel. Today I am on my way to Sunset Beach. I'm taking the SkyTrain and I'm about to get off at Main Street Science World Station here. This is Science World right across the street. A SkyTrain is passing by. SkyTrain is a really unique public transportation system here in Vancouver. So before going to the beach, I had lunch at um, my favorite place in Yale Town. I had a bowl of Pad Thai noodles with a bottle of Thai milk tea. Now I'm taking the little shuttle bus to Sunset Beach. Here is Yale Town Quayside. One of my favorite sketching places. Ooh, here we are at Sunset Beach. It's a really beautiful sunny day. And I'm about to get off the shuttle bus now. So the air is still pretty chilly in early spring, but it's very refreshing to be out here on the beach. Yeah, so that area is Granville Island and the Burrard Bridge that I sketched a few weeks ago. Here is English Bay. The sun is so bright. Now I'm sitting down on a rock and really enjoying this view in front of me while listening to the lapping water. Here's my gooseneck tripod attached to the edge of my sketchbook on my lap. Now I'm gonna put my phone right here. It's time to do the line work with my fine liner pen. I'm using the Windsor and Newton brand 0.8 tip fine liner pen. Okay, so the rest of this video it's gonna be in real time speed. I don't wanna speed it up because um, it's gonna be really shaky. Every time when I put my sketchbook on my lap to film, if I speed it up, it's gonna be too shaky for some people to watch. So if you wanna finish watching this video faster, you could adjust the speed. Uh, there's a tab on the bottom of the screen here that you can adjust the speed to watch this video like four times faster. Now I'm starting to draw the contour outline that I see of the mountains in the distance in several layers. Yeah, so this one is the mountain in the foreground. There are at least two more mountain ranges behind this. Yeah, mountains in the distance, the contour outlines are pretty vague compared to this one in the foreground. Now I am starting to draw a cargo ship that I see there in the very far distance. Yeah, just a very simple uh, little outline floating around the horizon there. And there is a larger cargo ship. Well, this one may not be um, a really larger cargo ship because it's actually less further away compared to the one on the left. Yeah, so things closer to us are always looking larger than the ones in the distance. And there's another cargo ship. And yeah, so now I'm drawing the bottom of the mountain there very gently and linking all of these cargo ships together very nicely. And moving on to the bottom of, of this foreground mountain here, before that, I want to just add a couple more cargo ships that I see. So I'm using very simple sets of lines to define uh, the character of these cargo ships in the distance. So they really look like real cargo ships, starting with the thin body part. And then these structures, including the decks. Yeah, and um, yeah, just a few lines to define each single cargo ship. Now extending the bottom line of the mountain towards the right. A pretty straightforward line. Now the mountains and the cargo ship together is really forming a lovely narrative of Vancouver landscape. Now I'm starting to draw the border of the seawall, the walkway. As you can see, the height of the wall there in the middle ground is looking a little bit shorter compared to the height of the wall in the foreground 
on the very right side of the page. Now I'm starting to draw these teeny tiny people walking. It's a bright sunny day, so a lot of people are, are out and about. So when I'm drawing these people very quickly passing by, I actually do most of these people from my memory because they are gone in like five seconds or so. Because these are tiny figures, I don't need to be so specific. Just make sure that their heads are actually pretty small. If the heads are way too big compared to the body, um, they might look like aliens. Yeah, and then just drawing their pants and shoes. Okay, now drawing the other side of the seawall, it's like a platform. I'm seeing uh, the platform from a very low angle below. Yeah, just doing their hair with solid black ink. And yeah, I want to do another little person there. Yeah, I think now as I'm adding these people, I am getting more engaged with the drawing process uh, because people all of a sudden, they just add life to an urban sketch. So even though I'm not super duper good at drawing people, I don't avoid adding people to my urban and landscape sketches. Now I'm starting to draw the foliage texture of this mountain here in the, in the middle ground. There are a lot of uh, different species of evergreen trees here in Vancouver. Now I'm actually drawing this uh, flat land on the bottom of the mountain. It's a beach area, I think it's in West Vancouver. And finish drawing the contour outline of this mountain. There's actually another mountain behind it. So most of the city of West Vancouver, just like the city of North Vancouver, as I mentioned before, is uh, situated mostly um, on, on the mountain here. So now I am drawing these tiny little blocks of houses taking over about one third of the bottom part of this mountain. So here in the distance, these buildings, they just look like little gray specks on the bottom one third of the mountain. And some folds of the mountain, a little bit of land showing in between the forest there. Now I'm moving on to this foreground, the seawall, starting to add the layers of concrete bricks. And then adding these uh, short vertical lines very loosely. Yeah, so these lines are almost invisible. And now I am making the bottom edge of the border here looking thicker because it's actually a pretty heavy row of concrete bricks. And also these vertical short lines, nice and gentle. And adding some more organic texture. And making the other side of the border a little stronger as well with a heavier line right there. Okay, now it's time to move on to the bottom of the seawall here, the base. Now starting to draw uh, the rocks laid out between the bottom of the seawall and the sea. Starting to draw this cluster here, close to the edge of the seawall there, trying my best to uh, uh, capture as many rocks as I can, almost using a blind contour drawing technique without looking at the paper too much. So when we're not looking at the paper way too much, we're drawing more based on what we truly see and not really from our preconceptions. So each of these rocks is of a different size and shape 
and I really like that. This is how nature works. Uh, we can't find two rocks that look exactly the same. At the same time, adding some hatching to suggest some volume for these rocks, and also uh, the cast shadows from one another. Keep drawing some more, and also adding a accentuation for the gaps. Yeah, this one is actually a really unique shape standing out from this huge cluster. So when I'm drawing a huge cluster of details like this pile of rocks, I don't get stress. I just try all my best to follow and trace out uh, the shapes of each rock as best as I can. If I miss like a couple rocks here and there, that's fine. I think the most important thing for us is to capture the feel of this pile here, the organic look of each rock. So if you missed including some rocks, this pile is still gonna make sense. All right, so now as you can see, uh, the rocks closer to me here, uh, near the foreground area, the placement is actually lower on the paper compared to those ones closer to the seawall. So there's a bit of sense of perspective over here. So the shape of the sea area now it's very much like a triangle and it's making this composition very interesting. Uh, when we're doing urban and landscape sketches, it's good to have you know triangular shapes in part of our composition. And here I'm adding some more rocks around the edge. So now as I am drawing this pile of rocks, I'm also creating a nice juxtaposition with the mountains in the distance. So juxtaposition is a kind of visual illusion that um, even though these rocks are looking as big as the mountains in the distance because they're so close up, and if there's someone passing by in front of this uh, rock pile, I, I might draw him or her's head uh, larger than a rock. Yeah, juxtaposition is making our sketches look m so much more compelling to look at. And by the way, um, I think I have a one point perspective here. So this rock pile is going upwards towards the right, trying to merge into a vanishing point with the turning point of the seawall on the upper right. So a lot of times when I'm sketching on location and just focus on the pure seeing experience, a lot of times I am not aware of the one point or two point perspectives that I'm dealing with. Yeah, so not overthinking and not overanalyzing, it's just making this whole sketching experience much easier for myself. And yeah, as you can see, as I'm drawing each rock, I'm also adding a bit of accentuation in between to separate each piece of rock. There's always like a dark gap or a cast shadow in between each rock. And because the sun is on the left, the right side of these rocks are shaded. So I'm also adding some very quick hatching lines on the right edge of some of these rocks to make them look more three-dimensional. Now I'm adding these um, isolated rocks around the pile here, closer to me in the foreground. Now I am drawing the foamy lapping water of the sea very loosely with gentle hand pressure. The more faster that we draw, uh, the more effectively that we are able to capture the fast movement. And being on location, it really helps me to draw these lines uh, even better because I can see much more clear. And by listening to the splashing sound of the sea, washing the beach and the rocks, I'm able to engage with my environment and therefore I'm able to draw more effectively. 
yeah, and just adding these tiny little pebbles with quick loose shapes. So as I'm drawing these teeny tiny details of pebbles, I'm trying to feel the rhythm with my heart and not just merely copying every single little detail that's out there. There's no need to draw every single little pebble that's on the beach, but it's good to capture the rhythm of it. And going back to the pile of rocks to add some accentuation, especially on the bottom of each piece and also on the right side. The sun is very strong, so I see good contrast with very sharp definitions of each rock. Now, as I finish drawing this pile of rocks, I feel like this is kind of like an orchestra. The tallest rock there in the middle is like a conductor. And maybe they're playing a melody of early spring. Now I'm drawing this largest rock here close to me in the foreground. And because the sun is on the left, the right side of this rock, and also the bottom of it, depending on its three dimension form. The bottom is uh, more heavily shaded and also the right edge. Now I am drawing the shape of the driftwood. So drawing another object other than another rock is actually um, showing the viewer into the picture with more interest. And this uh, sharp edged rock right underneath my feet. Yeah, and these rocks have uh, pretty flat surfaces. So I'm keeping uh, the drawing part of the foreground rocks very simple. And I just drew a couple more rocks over here around the corner of the walkway and finished drawing the rectangular prism base of the seawall. Yeah, just some final accentuations around there. Now I am drawing the rough texture on the base over here. So when there's high tide, a lot of seashells and seaweeds are being washed onto these rocks and all the way to the base of the seawall. And now I am using super gentle hand pressure to get these almost invisible lines done of the more gentle moving lapping water of the sea in, in the middle ground and also in the far distance. It's very interesting that when I'm looking at moving water, the waves in the distance, they look less rigorous uh, compared to the um, splashing ones in the foreground. So these waves in the far distance, they're almost like flat straight lines, super vague. I'm still using the same pen, the 0 0.8 fine liner pen. But by using a very gentle hand pressure, I'm able to create lines that are about the thickness of a 0 0.1 fine liner pen. Some final details, these little rocks and chips of seashells on the beach. Some more here. And there's actually another slab of concrete on the very bottom of the seawall here. And there's another uh, slab of rectangular prism shape that we can see two sides of it. Uh, the platform and also the thickness. Now moving on to the space right underneath my shoes. I'm starting to draw these grass growing in between the gaps of the rocks. So when I'm drawing these numerous blades of grass, I'm not trying to copy. I'm trying to feel how they're moving and bending down in the, um, in the spring wind. So my lines are pretty quick and a little rough. And I think being rough sometimes is a really effective way 
to draw things in the wilderness. Yeah, and I think that's very much it for this uh, big bush of grass. Now, I want to add a little bit more on the left side. So again, drawing uh, these bushes here in the very foreground area is adding another layer of juxtaposition and to establish a sense of depth even better. So when you're sketching out there, be really aware of the layers of objects that you can lay out on your sketchbook page. Now it's time to paint watercolors and the painting process, just like the drawing process, is gonna be in real time speed as well. If you wanna speed up, you can uh, uh, change the speed on the bottom of the screen. So I'm gonna begin painting the sky area as always when doing a landscape. So I just wetted the sky area with clear water and I just grabbed a bit of cerulean blue, diluted a little bit. So this is not a solid blue. The sky is most of the time to me, it has a really translucent kind of blue. Yeah, just spreading it out in very loose horizontal brushstrokes. And I am also using this blue to wrap around the shapes of the two chunks of clouds. So the clouds are in the positive space, the blue sky is the negative space. Uh, so sometimes I do like to paint the negative space first, just to define the positive space more easily. And also mixing a little bit green on the bottom of the sky here. Uh, for me, I can always sense some turquoise on the bottom of the sky close to the horizon. And now I am wetting the bottom of these two cloud areas with a little clear water and ready to put on the grayish shades. So I'd like to mix my own gray with um, cobalt blue and a little bit of purple. And just putting it very bravely around the bottom and using thinner brush strokes to suggest the folding areas around the middle part. So this is how I interpret the three dimension of this piece of cloud. It is three dimensional. It is a very um, organic kind of spherical shape. Now I'm ready to move on to this cloud. These two clouds are very light and fluffy and they don't have solid outlines. Yeah, same idea, same, same grayish color that I mixed with cobalt blue and a little bit of purple. Now I'm ready to add some contrast for the bottom part of this cloud. It's very much the same color, cobalt blue with a bit of um, purple. But for this layer, this bluish gray, it contains less water. And same for this cloud here on the right side. I'm preserving a lot of my brush marks. So when painting subjects like um, clouds and also trees and bushes, a lot of times I like to save my brush marks and not trying to blend with the previous layer. It's very important to use brush marks to depict the rhythm, the movement, and the, uh, the surface elevations. And I remember uh, people asking me why their brush marks are looking so harsh. I think one of the reasons is that uh, you didn't really capture the correct rhythm of the thing that you're painting. If you're just randomly putting brush marks on without following your real observations, the brush marks would just look harsh. And now I am putting a really diluted layer of yellow ochre mixed with a little bit of orange for the beach and also for these rocks. Now the weather really feels that it's a bright sunny day, but uh, without any contrast yet. So when painting watercolors, there's no need to rush to get the final tone on the paper right away. We always have to work in layers. So this is layer number one, 
for the beach and also for the concrete surface of the sea wall. And it's also very important to let this first layer dry before adding any further contrast. While waiting for the yellow areas to dry, I am wetting the sea area with clear water. And I'm ready to put on a transparent layer of blue, actually turquoise blue, with some cobalt blue or ultramarine blue mixed with a little bit of viridian green. Starting with this very gentle turquoise first. And my brush strokes are following the movement of the lapping water in horizontal directions. So when painting the surface of water, including the surface of sea, the, um, the lakes, a pond, it's so important to keep this first layer a really transparent tone of blue or turquoise. If you paint the water's first layer with a really solid color, it will be really challenging to depict the translucent quality of water. Okay, so now waiting for the yellow and turquoise areas to dry, I am adding on um, another kind of turquoise for this mountain range in the distance. Because of aerial perspective, the colors of mountains in the distance, they look more turquoise or blue. And for this mountain here in the, um, in the middle ground, the color is very natural, just a viridian green mixed with a bit of yellow ochre. And as you can see, even though I'm using a pretty solid color, I am not laying this color out on this mountain area in a solid way. There are actually uh, little translucent gaps for the mountain to breathe. Now, using the leftover turquoise to paint that peak behind. And now I am rubbing on and also uh, taking off a little bit of the green at the same time in certain areas uh, to create an illusion of the foliage forms on the mountain. So basically, there are rows and rows of evergreen trees growing on the mountain ranges in the greater Vancouver area. Okay, now I think I'm pretty, pretty much done with this mountain here in the, in the middle ground. Now I wanna add a little bit more contrast for the turquoise mountain there in the back. This time the turquoise contains less water compared to the previous layer. And the mountain there in the very back, it should be just a, a transparent blue, as it is. That's how I sense it. And just adding some final bits of strong tones for this peak there in the back. And now I think it's time to move on to make the water surface look more dynamic. So now I am grabbing some viridian green, mix it with the uh, cobalt blue. This time it's more concentrated, containing less water. So I'm using streaks of brush strokes to suggest the rows of lapping water. Sometimes I have to use the very tip of my brush to get these thin lines done. So if you're using the same hand pressure and the same angle, putting the brush down on paper, you're gonna end up with the same kind of lines um, or brush strokes. So um, your lapping water will look kind of um, monotonous. So it's good to be um, mindful of how you could hold the brush and how you could control your hand pressure. Follow the rhythms that you feel. I sense more movement of the lapping water here in the middle ground and the foreground area. The water looks very still in the distance. And the water coming over to the beach, it contains more um, tones of greens, probably because of the seaweed. And 
and just keep putting this nice vibrant but still organic green around the shore area yeah so the water here because of perspective is going up towards the right trying to merge into a vanishing point on the right side of the page keep adding some more green on the bottom of these rocks so it sends a lot of seaweed underneath and on the surface of these rocks brought up by the sea waves during high tide okay so now i'm trying to add another layer for the surface of the sea to give it more contrast especially for the foreground area that i could sense more layers of this turquoise tone yeah so this is very much the same turquoise color as before but um, containing less water and more warmer greens here to suggest the traces of seaweed and algae in the seawater here splashing onto the beach grabbing some leftover uh, green a warmer green for the little forest there on the bottom of the mountain there and for the next layer of these rocks they need a color like a color stain from the seaweed and algae during high tide now i think it's low tide and um, i mix this organic yellow green with leftover yellow orange and varying green this color is also pretty transparent i as i'm diluting it it was quite a lot of water for some of the rocks i feel um, they look more orangey so more ratios of orange yellow mix into the varying green just play around with the different ratios and moving on to the next layer for these rocks now i think i just grabbed some burnt sienna just so the right side of most of these rocks and also the bottom for some of these rocks are uh, more shaded with this brownish green and also for the base area of the sea wall here um, it also contains traces of algae seaweed stains yeah so just trying to get this organic feel for the beach and the seawall area same for the driftwood it's also a kind of a brownish green for these rocks here in the uh, foreground right underneath my feet i could see more definitions of uh, turquoise color and keep punching on this orange brown color to give more definition for the rocks and then going back to the bluish grays for the shaded areas and the little shadows of the rocks and pebbles using very tiny little choppy brush marks Yeah, so there are so many ways for us to express with a single brush. You could press harder to make thick and long brush marks. And for this area, I'm doing um, being more careful using small and choppy brush marks to get the texture of the pebbles done with the same brush. Um, it's the medium tip Holbein brand water brush. now i am grabbing some more yellow ochre mix it with the leftover brown a little bit to paint these grass growing in between the gaps of the rocks here right underneath my feet so if you're holding your brush in a 90 degree angle to the paper and moving swiftly over the paper area that you want to paint you're going to get pretty thin and natural brush strokes especially for painting grass 
and the bottom of these grass bushes uh, contains fresher greens. I just use very thin green. Yeah, so these are grass. These grass are like half dried. The soil here on the beach is um, too sandy and not so fertile for these grass to grow more healthily. Now I'm just grabbing some uh, cobalt blue and using pretty thin brush strokes to add the, uh, the most extreme shade color on the right side of these rocks because the sun, as I mentioned before, is on the left side and also on the bottom in between the gaps of each rock to create an even higher contrast. So to create high contrast, it's very important to not overpaint and leave the bright areas as they are. Yeah, so as you can see, I'm just punching on this bluish gray on like the, the one third area on the right side for each rock. Yeah, this one needs more precise brush marks because it's big. And keep using this uh, bluish gray tone to glaze over the dried yellow brown areas of the base of the seawall very lightly. The sun is really strong, so some shaded areas um, don't have that intense gray. Especially this seawall area facing the sun just had a little bit of a shade of concrete color. And I just grab some burnt sienna to add the thin streaks of shade for this cylindrical driftwood and a bit of blue on the very bottom of the driftwood. And keep grabbing some more cobalt blue, mix it with uh, purple. Yeah, so these rocks in the foreground, I think it's better to have another layer of shade. Yeah, so I'm very patient uh, painting in layers. I think this is the um, uh, essential technique for watercolor painting is that we have to work through the layers to add more definition for the objects that we're painting. And this rock here, because it's pretty large in size, its shadow is pretty big as well. Yeah, so now I'm grabbing some bluish purple here to add more contrast the base of the seawall. It's kind of like a stair, a very short staircase here. Yeah, and for the last 30 seconds of doing this sketch, I'm just adding tiny bits of uh, polish here and there, making the shadows stronger underneath uh, some of the rocks. So when painting on location, I don't set a timer for myself. I just, you know, concentrate on the uh, pure seeing experience and enjoy the drawing and painting process. So I think about 10 years ago, it would take me about like 90 or even two hours to paint something like this on location. But now this time it took me about 40 minutes to finish. Uh, the more time that you spend practicing, the faster you would do this. All right, so thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. Happy Easter. I hope you're having a great time with family. So if you like this video, please click like and leave me a comment below. Subscribe to my channel for weekly updates. I try to update my channel with two to three new videos every week. And I'll see you again very soon next time. Have a great long weekend, everyone. Bye.